Golden State Media Concepts Fantasy Football Podcast is your one-stop shop for fantasy football news and advice. Can't decide on who to draft on the first round? Going gaga on how to line up your team. Got you covered. Traditional leagues, dynasty leagues, PPR leagues, IDP leagues, IDP leagues, even daily fantasy football leagues. Join us as we break down all the questions of fantasy football. It's the Golden State Media Concepts Fantasy Football Podcast. What's up? It's Ethan from GSMC Fantasy Football Podcast on the GSMC Podcast Network. I hope everyone's having a wonderful day or start of your day, end of your day, whenever you choose to listen to this podcast. On the day that you choose to listen to it, I hope it's going well. Uh, We're still in the, the quarantine things. We're still, you know, the world's still going through some stuff. Uh, states are opening slowly but surely. As that's what the state governors and state officials, government, they're all trying to move towards getting people back to work. So, hope everybody stays safe out there, makes good decisions, and, you know, we'll all get through this one day at a time. Today on the Fantasy Show, I have a lot to talk about. Some Jameis Winston, some Andy Dalton, some Trevor Lawrence future projections, where we where we see he might go, and... Some team stuff since the draft just happened last week. We got to talk about how teams are made up or our teams are made up now, right? We have to think about that. And for fantasy purposes, we need to know which teams are probably the best surefire teams in every conference, division by division. So we're going to be doing a little bit of all of that and then some. But first, got to talk about Mr. James Winston. So James Winston is a new. Orleans Saint quarterback, a backup, who officially signed a one-year, $1.1 million deal on Tuesday with a maximum value of $4.7 million and had an Instagram Live interview basically saying that this is like going to Harvard Education uh, for quarterback school or anything like that. So this is like his graduate program, so to speak. He said, being part of the New Orleans Saints, being part with Drew Brees, Taysom Hill, Sean Payton, Joe Lombardi, and Pete Carmichael. When you think about that room, that is like Harvard. That's like a Harvard education in a quarterback room. And so he wanted to put his ego aside, put his money aside, think about his family, think about his career. There was no better position than to be in the same room with somebody that he's always looked up to, somebody he's always admired since playing the game in Drew Brees. So... Winston is doing the route of the humble guy, you know, trying to learn and trying to figure some things out underneath one of the legends in the game. And it's very cliche trope. A lot of guys do it. A lot of guys use it and say, I'm going to improve. I'm going to learn so much. And sometimes, you know, it's okay. Some people can learn all they want, right? Some people are whiteboard wizards. Some people can figure it out on the whiteboard and be one of the smartest guys in the room from a quarterback perspective, from a passing perspective, know all the X's and O's and all that. But when he gets on the field, it doesn't always translate. And that's the hardest thing about a quarterback. Sometimes you can be wicked smart, but it just doesn't translate. Your brain doesn't operate that fast or you don't have all the time in the world to, to know what's going on. You have to make really, really fast split second decisions. And we all know that Jameis Winston's, Calling card is bad decision making. Now, I'm not going to sit here and just think that it's not possible that Jameis Winston may have a comeback story in him. But from all accounts, Jameis Winston is no Teddy Bridgewater. Teddy Bridgewater and Jameis Winston are almost polar opposites in their play styles and how they like to go about and how offenses usually like to go about using these two players in different ways. So James Winston is a guy 
who always was able to chuck it down the field. We know his arm talent is spectacular. We know his physicals are really there and all of that. That's why he went number one overall. And we know that Teddy Bridgewater, although he had a really good college career, his physicals weren't always there and he wasn't a, a standout prospect coming out of school in the sense of he was going in the first round. That just was not the case. But here we are now looking at Jameis five, almost six years down the line. Jameis is not, he has not improved on his decision making. He has not improved really in the accuracy standpoint. And it's really, his turnovers are just kind of out of control. You can't, you look at the numbers from last year, you say, okay, 30 touchdowns, 5,000 yards. But if you really think about it, that is probably more of a product of the team that was put around him. Because if you look at some DVOA stats, you'll see that their defense was really, at a certain point, ranked in like the top five in DVOA. But in regular defensive stats, Tampa Bay was not that good defensively, but that's because James Winston was turning the ball over 30 times in a season and putting their defense in bad spots. So their defense is actually pretty good. And Jameis is just was not careful with the football nearly as much. And although he did get 5,000 yards, he did pass for a lot of touchdowns, it didn't end up putting them in a position to win. So I think that's why the decision by Bruce Arians and the Tampa Bay Bucks to not bring him back was probably easier said than done because at the end of the day, you can get it done with a Teddy Bridgewater way easier than you can with a Jameis Winston because although it's the fast car, if you can't afford to keep up with the fast car and keep up with the maintenance, you won't be driving it for too long. And maybe that's just a bad analogy, but... You know, Teddy Bridgewater is probably the probably the Honda Civic. You know, a good Honda Civic it lasts long. It does does what it needs to do, and you know you can get it tuned up. But I don't know if James Winston is able to be tuned up. James just might be who he is, and that's okay. But even then, so what that means is even after this basic. Uh, basically a sabbatical with Drew Brees and company in New Orleans. Are we ever going to see Jameis Winston in a position to showcase what he's learned, or is he going to be able to potentially take over as New Orleans quarterback? I I doubt it. I also find it funny how he mentioned Taysom Hill in the conversation as somebody to learn from, although Taysom Hill is, is older. He's uh, almost 30, like on the nose. But in reality, Taysom Hill is in a similar position as in my, well, he's not in a similar position from a quarterback perspective. Taysom Hill has as many question marks as Jameis because we just don't think, I don't personally think Jameis or Taysom Hill will ever be a true pure thrower of the football and he'll always be in these little gimmicky schemes because that's where he was, that's where his success is at. If he was really somebody who really could take over the position for the Saints. I feel like they would have more confidence in what he's doing. And I also think that they wouldn't be using him such as a Swiss Army knife of the sort. Now, maybe I might be wrong. Maybe they involve him in a different set of offense, right? Where people just let, they just start letting him throw the ball more. Maybe he comes out and instead of that one play, he comes in under center and it's a run play or it's a wildcat play or whatever the case may be, right? It's actually like a passing, a passing display. And people get so tripped out because they expect Drew Brees to be the one to start slinging the football out. And Sean Payton starts getting into fever dreams. I don't know what's going to happen <laughs> next season. We don't even know what next season's going to happen. But it's all exciting. But they needed a quarterback behind Taysom Hill. Just in case if Drew Brees goes down, they need a quarterback, so to speak. And Taysom Hill, at this moment in time, is still more of a gimmick than a quarterback until things are proven otherwise vague on the on the field. Also, a side note that we should probably talk about the fact that there are some other... What was it? Taysom, Taysom Hill did something. Now it's escaping me. 
something with the saints happened. I can't even remember. But essentially, all right, now I remember, now I remember, now I remember. So essentially, in ESPN Fantasy League, Taysom Hill is now under tight end and flex for fantasy. So that's that's pretty good for Taysom. You know, he was always a quarterback, so you can never really have him be anywhere else in uh, ESPN leagues. So this is good for deeper leagues that might need somebody who could potentially do some things for you. But I would be very cautious because even though he had seven touchdowns last year, they're very spacious. They basically were only t- there because Alvin Kamara put them in those positions. So how many times are we going to see Alvin Kamara only have two touchdowns in like a few weeks or in a long stretch of time? I doubt that will happen ever again. So I would just be a little bit wary of the of that pickup if you're going to look at him as a potential bang or bust player in your offense and i'd only look at him if you're really desperate for tight end help all right we're gonna take a break and we're gonna get into the andy dalton stuff you really can't underestimate the importance of having the right creative work for your brand or your product whether it's a logo a website a book cover or an ad campaign you really need a quality design to make that big difference pop and deliver your overall engagement and success in a competitive market. That's where Design Crowd comes in. Design Crowd has over 750,000 designers from Sydney to San Francisco ready to help you with awesome creative ideas. They make crowdsourcing work for you. So if you need a logo or you're working on your creative branding, you can go to designcrowd.com and post a brief describing the design you need. And then within about two to seven days, you'll receive up to over a hundred different designs from designers around the world. Then you pick the best design and approve payment to the designer. So you're only paying for the design that you want. It takes a lot of the guesswork out of freelancing and out of crowdsourcing. And you don't have to be a huge company like Harvard Business School to use Design Crowd, although they have used it as well. You can start a project on Design Crowd for as little as $99. And if you go right now to designcrowd.com forward slash health and wellness or enter the promo code health and wellness on their website, then our health and wellness listeners will receive up to $150 off of your design project. That's designcrowd.com forward slash health and wellness or entering that promo code health and wellness. Are you looking for the very best NFL and college football podcast? Then check out the GSMC Football Podcast. Get the latest football news both on and off the field. From the NFL draft to trades to the rumor mill to the NFL combines. They got you covered. That's gsmcpodcast.com backslash football dash podcast. Get updates on college rivalries, game day insights, and much, much more. It's football talk the way you want it. This show eats, sleeps, and breathes football. Don't forget to like them on Facebook and follow them on Twitter. Visit gsmcpodcast.com for more info. Right, so Andy Dalton was released Thursday morning, so a week after selecting the face of the franchise, face of the future, the Bengals are saying goodbye to Andy Dalton. They released him per his wish. Uh, Andy Dalton wished this, and this is what the Cincinnati Bengals had to say. They say Andy will always hold a special place with this franchise, and they know that he holds a special place in his heart as in team president mike brown he also says that this is a hard day for our club because we know and appreciate what a consummate professional andy has always been and they respect and appreciate andy and they thank them or thank him so the release came as a result for lack of trade market for the 32 year old quarterback and that makes a lot of sense as you can see guys like Cam Newton, guys like James Winston 
Although James Winston is a free agent more than a, uh, <laughs> he was a free agent more than somebody who was able to be traded away. But the market for quarterbacks definitely shifted vastly. Really, ever when Tom Brady went to Tampa Bay, things kind of really shifted around because then the Colts went and grabbed Phillip Rivers. And then the Chargers said that they were going to run with Tyron, but we all know that just means they're going to draft a quarterback to replace Tyrod when things were ready and time was necessary. So there were no trade markets, and there's really maybe only a few spots that Dalton could go. So, you know, Jay Gruden is the offensive coordinator as the or the offensive offensive coordinator for the Jacksonville Jaguars and it makes sense because they worked together from 2011 to 2013 during the best times that the Bengals were and don't forget the Bengals had some good seasons regular seasons and they had some playoff moments some of them not so good some of them okay but for the most part all things kind of flamed out but if you think about it, there have been some wins. When you go against the, the Pittsburgh Steelers all the time and the Patriots during the heydays of their time, it's hard to imagine that it was fun to be a part of that cycle where even the Texans have had some years where they could have went to the Super Bowl, but because they ran up against Pittsburgh or they ran up against the Patriots, things just didn't work out. Regardless, it would be one of the brighter spots back in the day so it could happen where a reunion would be happening with them but it would be weird because Garner Minshew would be around now there's no telling what Andy Dalton wants to do if he wants to be a starter or not but there's been considerable thought given to New England's current quarterback situation which is where I'm trying to get which already has Brian Hoyer and Jared Stidham And we're not too sure what Jared Stidham can do, but a lot of people are thinking that New England is just going to run with Jared Stidham until uh, sees further change. This is what Andy Dalton said to NFL Network's Michael Silver earlier in April. This year is different with no offseason, and I understand that. He obviously feels that he he brings value to a team and not only because of his abilities but because of everything he has learned and experienced it's an easy it's easy to stress about your situation to say what if it's this team or that team but there's no reason to try to what if yourself to death <laughs> it took me a minute i'm going to sit back and let this happen my wife and i this is Andy Dalton still speaking We're taking Wednesday night, and we're going to have such a peace about everything. We're going to be where God wants us to be, and it's going to work out exactly how it's supposed to. So, of course, Andy Dalton spent nine years with the Cincinnati Bengals, and in that span, he has completed 62% of his passes for 18,000 yards, 124 touchdowns, and 73 interceptions in 77 Starts, his passer rating was an 88.4, mirrored by his entire career. And while he's earned two of his three Pro Bowl selections in 2011 and 2014, things went south, of course, following 2015 as the Bengals finished under 500 in each of their final four seasons of a decade, regressing from playoffs, from a playoff team that could be counted on for wild card loss to one that was frequently picking in the upper half of the draft, such a descent bottomed out into Zach Taylor's first year as head coach and Dalton being temporarily benched for rookie Ryan Finley before returning to finish Cincinnati's 2-14 and season, which earned the Bengals the right to select Burrow to replace Dalton. So, that is it. He will always be considered, this is Zach Taylor talking, and he will always be considered a key member of the Bengals organization. Sent a statement, his teammates and coaches appreciated his leadership and his commitment to winning. Just as importantly, Andy and his wife, JJ, are leaving a lasting impact in the community with an incredible work their foundation has done over the years. Andy and his family 
have meant a lot to this team and the city, and we wish them the best in the future. So that is that is really the it for Andy Dalton there. And from what I hear from a lot of fans and people, it didn't always work out the way they want to on the field. But off the field, Andy Dalton was nothing more than a great guy who did great things for the Cincinnati community, and which is great because sometimes even if Ohio Sports had the best best of times besides LeBron. So when you really think about it, Ohio is has probably a lot more community driven things rather than expecting of championships all the time. And I know everybody wants to win, right? That's the reason why you play games, but to be part of your community, that's almost as big as winning a championship year in and year out is being able to, to help give back and help provide things to those less fortunate. So Andy Dalton is also one of those real, real good guys out there doing his part for his community and now he's going to be gone. So we don't know where he's going to go. My money is on two teams right now that I'm thinking of off the top of my head. And that's either the Pittsburgh Steelers or he's going to go to the Patriots. Because we've already saw where the market is. Right? There's only another There's only another quarterback that's really that might have a chance of getting somewhere. And that's Cam Newton. But I feel like Andy Dalton is a guy who understands the situation. We don't really know where he wants to, he doesn't know where he wants to play, and he's not really worried about it. So, he's made some money in his career, and if it's not about the money, which I don't think it might be, if it's just about playing and having another chance of proving himself as a starter quality quarterback, and maybe his situation in Cincinnati was not the best. As you can see, their offensive line was pretty terrible for the last couple of years. Maybe he ends up going to the Patriots for a one year or a two year or something like that. Or maybe he ends up going to the Steelers where this is probably big man's last year. It should be, if we're being completely honest. It should be. Or, of course, he might go to Jacksonville. And Jacksonville would make some sense. We don't know if he'd start there in Jacksonville. Primarily because Garner Minshew looks to be the guy they're trying to groom as their future franchise quarterback, but having somebody like Andy Dalton in the quarterback room, so to speak, would be really nice for their setup as it would bring a veteran guy who's been around the block, played nine seasons, started all nine seasons, and he's seen it all from getting it to the playoffs, being in tough situations. He's not, he hasn't been, he's been challenged in every, any step of the game from, from that point of view. So, I think that Andy Dalton, anywhere he goes, he'll be welcomed. I just don't know if every situation would be what Andy would want it to be, right? It's going to be tough to try and put yourself in a kind of a Nick Foles role, just waiting, waiting your time, so to speak, for something to maybe happen or maybe not happen. And it doesn't look like there's a lot of starter positions out there for anybody left on the quarterback market. So that includes people like Cameron Newton, right? So... Cam is still on the market, and I just have a hard time seeing where he would instantly start at. And you would want to say somewhere like the Steelers, because Ben is really not. There's no way Ben is going to get any better than he has been, and it's only it's only down from here, really. And after that injury, we don't really know what we're going to get from Big Ben. So everywhere else is just either the Patriots or some other team where he sits under for a year, but. We're going to take another break and we're going to get into the future of the NFL. You really can't underestimate the importance of having the right creative work for your brand or your product. Whether it's a logo, a website, a book cover, or an ad campaign, you really need a quality design to make that big difference pop and deliver your overall engagement and success in a competitive market. That's where Design Crowd comes in. Design Crowd has over 750,000 designers from Sydney to San Francisco ready to help you with awesome creative ideas. They make crowdsourcing work for you. So if you need a logo or you're working on your creative branding, you can go to designcrowd.com and post a brief describing the design you need. And then within about two to seven days, 
you'll receive up to over a hundred different designs from designers around the world. Then you pick the best design and approve payment to the designer. So you're only paying for the design that you want. It takes a lot of the guesswork out of freelancing and out of crowdsourcing. And you don't have to be a huge company like Harvard Business School to use Design Crowd, although they have used it as well. You can start a project on Design Crowd for as little as $99. And if you go right now to designcrowd.com forward slash health and wellness or enter the promo code health and wellness on their website, then our health and wellness listeners will receive up to $150 off of your design project. That's designcrowd.com forward slash health and wellness or entering that promo code health and wellness. Check out the show that's built on the MMA. From the UFC to extreme cage fighting, they got the fights covered. Check out the GSMC MMA podcast. Get the latest news on past or upcoming fights. Join us as we talk to and about some of the biggest names in the MMA, past, present, and future. When it's the fight game, there's just one show to check out. GSMCpodcast.com backslash MMA dash podcast. Don't forget to like them on Facebook and follow them on Twitter. Visit G. GSMCpodcast.com for more info. So I wanted to take some time in this podcast to talk about the future of the NFL, which is quarterbacks, because quarterbacks always come and go and they cycle out over the years. And usually everybody's trying to find their franchise guy and the next guy on that list right now, who could be your franchise guy is Trevor Lawrence, the coveted next quarterback to come probably in the first pick overall in the NFL draft. So here we go. Who, where's the landing spot for them, for him, I should say? Where is he going to go? So, there are not as many horrible teams in the NFL right now. We're in a, we're in a spot to where a lot of teams could be competitive and there's no telling what side, where, who goes where and what happens. So, Miami was not that good in the beginning. Well, they were really, really bad in the beginning of the year last year and then they came back won a couple games, and they still ended up being able to get their quarterback. Now I'm not sure what that means for other teams because Trevor Lawrence is so good, but there's no telling if he'll go first overall because of whatever the needs the teams might need. But we're just going to go with who who might need Trevor Lawrence. So if all things go to where I think one of the – the team that I expect that probably might need Trevor Lawrence is Jacksonville. I just don't think their roster is built to compete, especially in the AFC South team that already has Houston and Indianapolis and Tennessee. Indianapolis looks like they're going to be making a comeback and their seven to nine record does not speak to how much they're talented per like per roster spot against other teams. So I think Indianapolis is going to take a leap. I think Tennessee Although they went 9-7, and seven, they went on that huge run, and I think that they'll carry that momentum into the new season fresh with their new starting quarterback, or should I say retaining starting quarterback right now. And, of course, Houston is however good. How much can Deshaun Watson carry this team? And with Brett and Cooks and seemingly looking like they're going to be trying the hardest to get a balanced attack going instead of throwing it down the field. And they do have a lot of speed on the outside, so we're just going to have to see how the offense goes. But they went 10-6 and six last year, and they were a hot streak team, so they would be streaky and then they'd be weird other ways. But that's just kind of how the game goes with Houston. So I don't really see any of those three teams being anything but competitive within their division. So uh, Jacksonville might get the short end of the stick there. They went 6-10 and 10 last year and had a lot of injuries, so maybe that might change some things, but I think that 
Jacksonville has got to be one of the front runners for the Trevor Lawrence, uh, the Trevor Lawrence Bowl. Next has to be Denver because I'm not sold on Drew Locke. I don't know if Denver is sold on Drew Locke. And if Denver has the most bang or bust potential of a team this year, because although Los Angeles Chargers went five and 11 last year, there's no telling what they're going to be this coming year because they have a rookie. They have Tyrod Taylor. So their offense, we know how talented their team is overall, but when you don't have a quarterback to be stable and be able to play at a high level, all that talent can sometimes be overshadowed. Look at Cleveland. So we don't know what Los Angeles is going to do, but I know they're not going to take a quarterback. Denver has the most bang or bust potential. I think I like majority of the parts of their roster, but we have to look at it from this perspective. Quarterbacks drive this league, and if your quarterback can't get it done on the field, right, if they can't get it done on the field, they had a 2-6 and six record last year on the road. That is not good. By any stretch of the means. So if they do flop, which is possible because Oakland is no slouch at 7-9 and nine last year. I thought they lost some games they weren't supposed to, especially like one at Green Bay. Definitely weren't supposed to lose that game. And although Denver went on a 4-1 and one win streak to end the season, I just don't know where they'll end up this coming season. And it feels more so that they might bust just because we haven't seen enough from Drew Locke. Next, of course, I'd have to say Washington, because their quarterback situation is very strange to me, because if, you know, if our boy there, Haskins, can't get it done, this has to be out for him, right? Because they're not going to start Kyle Allen and say he's the face of the franchise, right? They're probably going to tank another year, And get in the top five to hopefully secure Trevor Lawrence. And that's probably going to, that would make a lot more sense to me personally is Washington try to get him or maybe even Chicago if things go south. Chicago, even though they have Nick Foles now, I don't think Nick Foles is the future for a lot of guys' mindset. I think Nick Foles is past that prime. And if Nick Foles can't get it done, They're not going to give Nick Foles another year to shine primarily because we know how this works. You only get another year when you're young and Nick Foles is not a young guy. So we're already past the point with Mitchell Trubisky where we're giving him another year. They're putting competition, quote unquote, for Mitchell Trubisky. But really, Nick Foles is going to probably start for them. NFC South is pretty much locked in for the next few years. I don't see any quarterback changes whatsoever. No matter what the the records look like, they're not going to go get another quarterback. And NFC West probably in the same in the same framework. You know, Russell Wilson, Jimmy Garoppolo is iffy, but I don't think they're going to be bad enough to be able to get Trevor Lawrence. And Arizona has their quarterback for their foreseeable future. And the Rams, just uh, the Rams still have. Their quarterback on a killer salary, so there's just no telling where that's going to lead. Now, the wild cards, of course, maybe the Patriots just really stink next year, and that will put them right in position to maybe get Trevor Lawrence. I don't think the last time, I don't know when's the last time we saw the Patriots in like the top 10 of the NFL draft before. Maybe when the Brady got hurt, that probably was it. Other than that, I don't think we've seen them anywhere close to the top 10 in draft order before in a long time. So probably since I've been alive, I haven't seen them in the top 10. At least since I've been watching the sport, we haven't seen them in the top 10. But at last, you never know. Football, anything can happen. Where would be the best situation for Trevor Lawrence? Mm, I'm not too sure. You would think... You want a good offensive line because you don't want to put your, your quarterback in disarray for the first couple of years. So the Giants are out of there. And even though the Giants already have their quarterback that they say they believe in, they're, they're about as big of a chance to go bang, go bust as Washington. Washington just drafted some O-linemen. And honestly, they're talented across the roster in a lot of different spots. But at the same time, it doesn't always come together. 
I think Chicago would be an interesting place for a young quarterback because their defense is already really stout. You wouldn't, you could pay defenders because you already got your quarterback on a rookie salary and it would be fixed. So you wouldn't have to deal with uh, inflating costs later on down the line. So everybody else could get paid because that's the formula, right? You pay everybody else around your young quarterback and you try to do everything to win a championship in those four year window. And if you do, fine, great. Eventually you'll pay the quarterback and then you have to rebuild from there. Or it doesn't work out and you still have to pay your quarterback and you have to rebuild anyway. That's if the quarterback turns out to be good. Um, there's real, there's no real other place I can see him other than that. So I guess those three is Denver, New England if things go south for them, uh, Pittsburgh if things go south, and Jacksonville. So, of course, we know that Andy Dalton might go to Jacksonville. There's a, there's a strong case to be made going with his former offensive coordinator that he played with in 2011 through 2013. Way back in the day with the Bengals. It's so weird to think that 2011, 2013 was so far away. So long ago that, that that came about. But no doubt that was about nine years ago. All right. So we're going to move on here, take another break, and then we're going to get into the best teams in every division. And we're going to do the AFC first. And talk about that in terms of fantasy football production. Check out the show built around the women of MMA. From the UFC to the extreme cage fighting, we got the fights covered. Listen. It's the Golden State Media Concepts Women's MMA Podcast. The latest news of upcoming fights, discussions of previous matches. Join us as we talk to and about the biggest names in women's mixed martial arts. Past, present, and future. When it's the women's fight game, you know where to listen to. The Golden State Media Concepts Women's MMA Podcast. All right, so coming back in, we're going to talk about best teams in every division for fantasy. We're going to go with the AFC first, because A starts before the letter N. That is your daily alphabet take. Okay, (laughs) that's your your daily dose of the alphabet. Anyway, here we go. So, AFC East, New England is kind of weird, right? New England doesn't have a, a standout guy on any side of the offense that I would trust in my hands, or I trust with my life right now to say these are your these are your guys right now, and it's probably going to stay weird for some time. Let's look right now. They did draft a couple tight ends. They did draft some guards, some centers, but other than that, there's not really. It's not really any any surefire places where I'm thinking, okay, this is going to be where th- this is the target, right? So, of course, Sonny Michelle is still there. So, I guess that's your one guy that you can say that you would draft because of namesake. But Sonny Michelle has been weird. We don't know just exactly what what and who they are as, as a team. And Sonny Michelle has had a weird time since his rookie year. Really being there because he does not really catch too much. Of course, it's Julian Edelman, who has been playing since for 12 years. Like, he, he's been in the league for 12 years now. But I can't say you want to take him over anybody else that's been around, right? I wouldn't personally. And I think that, honestly, this is the roster that you're going to look at coming into the season. I don't know if they take another quarterback right now, but... You're not taking Rex Burkhead. You're not taking these. You're not taking these guys. This is not happening, right? You're not taking this. So let's move on. AFC East ladder. Now 
we have Miami here. I think that if you think that Miami is going to be really, really quality, right, you think Miami's going to find it. They have a lot of receivers on their roster that potentially could have some really good years with their new guy at the helm. So, of course, we have wide receiver that really, really came out and and shook some things up. So, let's see. They still bring in Devontae Parker. So, that's their standout guy, Devontae Parker. And then coming out, we have new running back. So, they get Matt Breda. That's nice. They traded for him. They have Preston Williams, who had a pretty good year before injury. They bring all these guys, so they have like Kyle Van Noy, but he's not. He's a defensive player. I'm just saying who they all bring. Run to the table. Albert Wilson's pretty good. And it looks like they are going to really, really have a nice chance of figuring some stuff out with their offense because it was already pretty decent beforehand before they went and drafted Tua. So I think they're going to be more wide receiver heavy and they're going to be throwing the football down the field and we're going to probably see Devontae Parker shine a little bit more and look like he belongs. I think the best offense by far in in this place though, in this in this conference, in this division has to be the Buffalo Bills because of just John Brown. They have of course, from via trade, they have Stephon Diggs. And it looks like Delvin Singletary is going to be their guy. In the backfield, they have no excuse to do anything but succeed there. And that's how I feel about it. And I think everybody else feels about the same way as well. The Bengals, they just got two, two, two great players in two different rounds. So... Of course, they get their quarterback for the foreseeable future and Joe Burrow, and then they get T. Higgins, his opponent that uh, he played in the National Championship game. So that's a quality, quality thing to have, a young quarterback and a young wide receiver growing together. They're going to be a great tandem in this league, I assume. And then they still have A.J. Green on roster, and they're going to be having... A lot more people come in and out. They still have Joe Mixon. Their roster is very deep and talented at the skill position. And I think that they're going to figure out some things that are going to shock people. You know, they still have Giovanni Bernard, the Swiss, the guy that always has some pretty good four weeks of football until he falls off a cliff. I know everybody's picked up Giovanni Bernard before in fantasy. <laughs> It's just a rite of passage at this point. He'll drop 18 in one game. You're thinking, well, maybe I'll pick him up. And then it'll be over. <laughs> it'll be all over. He's just rotting on your bench. Happens every season. And that's just how it works out. So, of course, like I said, A.J. Green. They have T. Higgins. They still have, if I remember correctly, unless he's left in free agency. They have John Ross, right? And their wide receiver group is really, really special. So they have a lot of speed on the outside. They have some guys that can possession catch. Of course, A.J. Green is an all, all-world all wide receiver when healthy. So I think this team is going to be really, really quality coming out the gates if Joe Burrow is who we think he is. And we'll be seeing somebody that will be really, really shining in the AFC North for years to come. Then we have the Buffalo Ravens. I'm sorry, the Buffalo Ravens. The Baltimore Ravens. The Ravens are pretty good. Like always, they went, got J.K. Dobbins. They went and got Delvin Dumay. And their roster was already pretty stout. Of course, you know, the best offensive weapon in fantasy last year as their quarterback was in Lamar Jackson. He was there. Doing his thing all last season, man, it was a big time victory for those who, who got him in the later rounds. And then somehow they have DeAnthony Thomas, but that's not really something I want to talk about. They have Willie Sneed, who is a good 
a good short route runnage receiver. And if you run PPR, he might be somebody you want to look into. And then you have guys on the outside that are really fast. So let's see. Uh, that Miles Boykins is pretty good. He's played for two years or so. He might be able to do some things. And of course, Marquise Brown is somebody who a lot of people are going to be looking at. Then they have Gus Edwards coming in to help with the running back. And then, of course, Mark Ingram. So they're a real run-heavy team. And then you can't you can't forget their, their tight end tandem and the leading of that tandem of the tight ends is Mark Andrews, the guy who really, really cemented himself as one of the top five tight ends in fantasy right now. So, yeah, Mark Andrews is somebody who is honestly going to be one of those guys that you might see go second. And that would be a good tandem. If you can get Mark Andrews and you can get uh, Lamar Jackson, that would be really, really stellar for your unit. We're going to go ahead and keep going. we got two more two more divisions to go. I don't feel like I have to talk about Cleveland. We know the offensive weapons of Cleveland, and then it's all up to what their potential is. Houston, you got Deshaun Watson. You got um, their newly, newly acquired via trade, Brandon Cooks, and, you know, Kiki, Kiki QT, and uh, you have – guys on the outside that can go speed rush or they can go speed and go run streaks all day so we know where the offense is going of course they also acquired via trade uh mr johnson in the backfield so we don't really know what he's capable of since all the injuries and stuff but that's just what they are uh if you're going for deshaun that's fine everybody else is kind of a toss-up until we see what's going on tennessee we know what the show is, their Henry show, and then everybody else. I wouldn't really look into wide receivers for this group just because I don't know how much they're going to dedicate in balancing that offensive attack, and it'll be a lot more bang or bust if they get no touchdowns. You will be a sad guy. Indianapolis is in an interesting spot. They have a lot of good players coming in. They have Jonathan Taylor coming in from the draft. They have... Um, another wide receiver coming in as well. They drafted in the second round or yeah, in the second round in Michael Pittman. So they definitely have some players that they expect to do great things. Of course they bring in Phillip rivers. Phil River, Philip rivers is usually a good fantasy guy, but of course you never really know. They do still have T Y and that's always something nice. They still have Jack Doyle, which is nice. And they also bring in, uh, Burden as well, Trey Burden at the tight end spot, so that might help bolster some things. They have one of the better offensive lines in the league, and they still have Marlon Mack, the Mack man, and that could be something that they could use to their advantage. Fantasy wise, they might have a lot of spreading the ball stuff going on, so it may not be where you want. Kansas City is uh, more of the same. They added uh, Claire Ellis or uh, <laughs> Jackson Clyde. Clyde Edwards declare their uh their number one or their first round running back they selected. He's gonna be dope, I believe. He's gonna do a lot of the dirty work, he's gonna get a lot of the catches out the backfield. He showed a lot of that ability in his last year at LSU. Of course we know all their other standouts, so of course Travis Kelsey, of course, you see the speed demon out there. Their whole team is full of speed guys, so is Patrick Mahomes is probably going to have another good year. They're just one of the better offenses you can ever draft in fantasy ever. A lot of their guys go in the first couple rounds of the draft. Denver, they get CeeDee Lamb, or I'm sorry, they get Jerry Judy. And they're looking to, they're putting a lot of faith into Drew Locke. So they also have Melvin Ing, or Melvin Gordon. So that's something they'll be looking at. L.A., uh it's kind of kind of shifty. LA has a lot of players that could do some things, and it all really depends on if their quarterback can. They're probably going to be developing some because, of course, they got a rookie. I don't know if they're going to really, really be able to showcase their full sets of talents. Oakland, 
uh, there's another team that also drafted a wide receiver from Alabama, Henry Ruggs, and then they, of course they have Josh Jacobs from Alabama, and they also had a pretty pretty good season coming from their tight end spot, which was something that was really nice to see from uh, Darren Waller. So ha- adding that wide receiver threat is going to be really good for them, and we'll just have to have to see what they can do all together. But that is the that's the AFC team. So we're going to take a break and go into AFC. Are you looking to get your college football fix? Looking to get the latest news on your favorite school's team? The GSMC College Football Podcast is your ticket to all things college football. Join us as we talk college football from the national championship, the college rivalries, the bowl game, to the Heisman Trophy, to which conference is the best. We've got you covered for the Big Ten, SEC, Big 12, the Pac-12, ACC, and everything in between. Download the GSMC College Football Podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Google Play, or anywhere you find podcasts. Just type GSMC in the search bar. Okay, so NFC, the Eagles, the Eagles went and drafted a quarter, I'm sorry, drafted a wide receiver with their first round selection in Jalen Rager, and then they drafted Jalen Hurts afterwards. I don't know what their plan is for Jalen Hurts. They also drafted in the fifth round John Hightower as another wide receiver, so you know they're bolstering their outside because their wide receiver position has been decimated via injuries and via bad play for quite some time. So they added those two guys, and in the coming times, here we got we got Dallas Goddard at the wide receiver. They have Marquise Goodwin via via free agency via trade, and they also are still rocking with guys like Elijah Holyfield, like Deshaun Jackson, who they also got in free agency, like Alshon Jeffrey is coming back. Hopefully, he can stay healthy. There's going to be a lot of places to spread the ball around, so there's really no telling but where they're going to be as far as their ceiling and their floor. They could have, they look like a team that could have a lot of high ceiling as a successful NFL franchise, but for fantasy, you never know where the ball will really land, and that's just kind of where their offense is going to be. Dallas, we know about Zeke. We know that they also have... Some standout wide receiver help now, especially after landing CeeDee Lamb in almost a steal sort of way. They definitely get him, and that just bolsters your offense to a whole other level, in my opinion. So they already had Amari Cooper, another Alabama prospect, another Alabama wide receiver. They're just all, everybody's just got Alabama wide receivers. But, of course, they have him. Of course, they have Zeke. And... They don't really have the tight end that you would like to see right now, but they're making it work, and they have a lot of threats on the outside that can really do some damage. So the sky is the limit for them, and I believe that they're going to have a really, really good offense with Dak coming back and doing his thing, and I think a lot of people are not going to. You you can't miss out on some of these guys. I think CeeDee Lamb is going to go really, really high in some drafts. He may go... Over, like he may be too high in some drafts they might go into, but that's here nor there. Then Green Bay, I'm looking at Adam Jones, and I'm looking at, of course, their their sole receiver out there and Devontae Adams. Everybody else is just whatever. Minnesota, of course, Minnesota is a uh, team that has is pretty similar to me as far as what they are planning to do. They got Justin Jefferson, so that's good. They replaced their outside threat in Stephon Diggs with a younger guy on a lesser deal, so that's good for them. And let's go down the roster list here. They they do have one of the better running backs in the league in Dalvin Cook, who, if he stays healthy, he's a instant threat. He gashed the Saints in the playoffs, completely took them out the game. So we all know about that. We know about Mason Rudolph. I'm sorry, not Mason Rudolph. We know about... Kyle Rudolph, the tight end, and 
We also know that one of their best wide receiver threats is Adam Thielen out there. So there's a lot of weapons for Kirk Cousins to get the ball to. So I would expect to see a lot of good offensive potential coming out of the Vikings yet again. And I believe their defense will be really nice too, as defense still scores points. Um, going into the NFC South now, Alvin Kamara, Michael Thomas, we all know those guys are going to be the feast, the feast guys on the Saints offense if they're not the quarterback. So, and I'll throw in Jared Cook as well as a guy who's probably going to feast in that offensive scheme. Atlanta, we all know Julio is going to get his touches. We all know that we'll see some good things. Hopefully, it, it'd be nice to see an uptrend in other positions on that offense. They lost one of their they lost their best offensive weapon from last year at the tight end spot to Cleveland and in uh free agency. So now they're kind of working their way back into seeing what they can do. So let's go down the roster for a little bit here. They did pick up Todd Gurley in free agency after being cut by the Los Angeles Rams. And then they still have Russell Gage who had a kind of Kind of interesting year last year, as in he he showed up when he needed to, and he was a little bit of a bright spot in a tough season for the Falcons. And then we see, you know, we need to see what Calvin Ridley's uptick is. We need to see where he where he can be. Edo Smith is somebody who, in deeper leagues, I've seen people play and trust. But and they also got Lacan Treadwell, but I don't really see him, but more as a as a depth guy at the position. But the Falcons, the Falcons offense is as good as, as it can be for the time being. Tampa Bay is, we don't know what the potential might be, but we know what the floor should be. So that means, uh, Godwin. That means Mike Evans, uh, now Gronkowski. And that's just where they are currently. That's, that's their three. That's their big three right there and Tom Brady is the quarterback for their future. San Francisco is a bit interesting. So San Francisco has a lot of a lot of a lot of weird like that Brandon Ayuk where they got via the draft and then their roster is a lot of really, really interesting skill guys, guys that can do a lot of different stuff. So for they have Travis Benjamin now via free agency and they have Kendrick Bourne last year who really did show some things that were interesting. They got Tevin Coleman still, and hopefully he's healthy and ready to go. Of course, you know, they have probably the best tight end in football right now in George Kittle. And they have Jerry McKinnon coming back from injury as well. They just have a lot of interesting guys. Evo Samuels, they have... Chris Thompson as wide receiver. They just, the team structurally is, there's not so many guys who are super big names, right? They're not, besides George Kittle, but everybody else fits in this offensive scheme so well and they just do so well and they just destroy, destroy people with this, with this offense. It's really, really fascinating what they're able to do there. Kyle Shanahan is able to do with this, with this offensive juggernaut of a team. And we'll just, we'll have to see if they're able to continue this trend of just being a high powered offense that shares the ball, but really wants to run the ball down your throat more times than not, but they can get really, 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 really shifty with their offensive schemes. All right. So Seattle, we know that Russell Wilson is their bread and butter guy. And if you can get him in fantasy, uh, congratulations. Because he is just a all he's an all stud. He's an all time stud in fantasy. He's always a fantasy MVP candidate year in and year out. We know Chris Carson should be coming back from injury. That will be really, really good for them. Um they have a few great stud wide receivers that one that goes long and one that goes long and also can be a bit of a possession guy. So DK Metcalf is the guy that I expect to take a gigantic leap in the in the likes of someone like a Julio and the likes of someone like a Michael Thomas and the likes of someone like a DeAndre 
Hopkins, those type of guys. They had really, really good second years, and I expect DK to do the same. Tyler Lockett should be as good as he has been in the previous years, and he's just, as long as he doesn't lose any speed, he will be as good as uh, any deep threat in the league. Then, of course, we know about their their tight end, who really, really is kind of sneaking into the scene right now as far as people talking about him. But I'm really not, actually, I'm not seeing him on his roster right now. Maybe he left in free agency. That's weird. But um, I remember, what was his name? Haskett? Hickles? <laughs> well, Hollister. There we go. Hollister. I couldn't remember off the top of my head. But Jacob Hollister, he's still there. I couldn't find him. But, you know, it's a roster that really, really could could push some things, put some things into perspective. And it would be interesting to see if they could they could really spread the ball and get the ball loose, as we know. We know that Russell Wilson tends to get a lot of numbers, but sometimes it it can be a a one man one man army and spreading the ball is not always something that is is usually your turn my turn your turn your turn sort of thing. It cycles, so not everybody spreads the rock all the time and spreads the sugar. The Rams they have a lot of interesting things going on. They got Cam Akers. They got Van Jefferson is a guy who's a guy from Florida that a lot of people were really high on coming out of the combine. So Cam Akers is somebody that goes, we know already about Malcolm Brown. Now I'm not saying that he's going to be a guy that you're going to want to look to really go deep into the draft, but that's a, you're seeing a running back by committee situation here. Jared Goff, of course, is still the, the quarterback. Tyler Higby, it might be somebody you want to look into. Van Jefferson, of course, is somebody that is going to be on a lot of people's radar as well as Cooper Cup coming back. And Cooper Cup is usually their breadwinner. So Robert Woods is still there as well. There's going to be, I think this offense could really turn it around if they want to. So if all things are well and good, their offense can turn it around and be one of the better offenses in the National Football League that we're used to seeing. And then for Arizona, here we go. This is the last team we're going to cover, Arizona. We know about they drafted Isaiah Simmons, but he does not play any offensive positions. But I expect great things coming out of Isaiah Simmons. Here we go. You know who they got. They got DeAndre Hopkins in free agency. You know that their quarterback situation for now is set in stone with who they think is going to be their guy for a very long time. They are still have Larry Fitzgerald, which is great. And we're seeing they have uh, Kenyon Drake. They have Chase Edmonds, who has been there for quite some time. And this team is starting to round itself out. Christian Kirk is a great guy for them to be a third wide receiver among them. They just have all the they have it down, man. This is their this is their time to really try and gel and figure some stuff out. I don't know how long Larry is going to continue to play, but I would be, I would not lie to you if I'm not excited for, for this offense, but we're going to take our final break here and then we're going to come back and finish off the podcast. This is your ultimate stop for everything sports. The Golden State Media Concepts Sports Podcast. Should I say more? From the NFL, MLB, the NBA, to MMA. It's all in here. The Golden State Media Concepts Sports Podcast. Listen now. Okay, so I wanted to end off this podcast with a little bit of a fantasy story of my own, man. Uh, I've been, you know, about names in your fantasy teams. Fantasy team names kind of can come out the blue, can kind of, you try to be witty sometimes. You try to figure some things out that, you know, sometimes you make it, you make it off of the team you drafted. Sometimes you make it off of your favorite team or anything like that, so... 
there's a lot of different team name composition that people can get creative with, right? So, for instance, in my league that I was in, somebody named their team Once Upon a Time, which is nice. <laughs> They're obviously an Eagles fan. Somebody had Can't Guard Mikes because they drafted Michael Thomas, and they also had Mike Evans. So, you know, Can't Guard the Mikes, things like that. Um, and then of course you have, you have, you know, kind of lame teams like Money World or people like to, you know, people like to copy all different types of stuff. But, uh, someone's name last year was called uh, Dior Disappointment, which is funny to me. Um, but my team was called Derrick Henry and the Scammers. And why that is, I did not have Derrick Henry on that roster last year this last fantasy season i did the year prior though and derrick henry the year prior was not not somebody who i enjoyed having on my roster here's why derrick henry was probably the most uninteresting uninterested football player as far as fantasy was concerned two years ago he would never he would not show up when it was time to he just didn't do what you needed him to do throughout the regular season. So he would just sit on my bench, right? And Derrick Henry has been dropped in many times. And during his league, people would have him, drop him, have him, drop him. And it just would not amount to really anything, really anything at all. And I'm just scraping by these fantasy playoffs, man. I'm just scraping by. I'm trying my hardest to make it. And I make it in the in the first round. So in the first round, I am I'm here. I'm ready. I'm ready to go. And this is where where things get kind of shifty. So this is the fantasy playoffs, and I'm not trying to to risk it all. Tennessee is playing, I believe, a Thursday night game. And Thursday nights at the beginning of Thursday night games were not really great. They're actually pretty abysmal, in my opinion. They were pretty much pretty much just not quality play all across the board and I was not trying to risk it all so to speak to essentially give myself a a fighting chance I didn't want to risk it so I wanted to to be able to go this is of course the year that Derrick Henry decided to <laughs> have almost two 100 yard plays uh in a row this is I think this is the year that Derrick Henry let me look it up. Derrick Henry versus the Jaguars. Because he just went bananas. Like, absolutely bananas. And he had like 50 fantasy points that I needed to win. So, it was so bad. All the, the whole year, Derrick Henry was just out of control, right? And it was something that I just, I I couldn't fathom. So in December the 7th, 2018, it was the, it was the death of my fantasy season. Uh, so he had about 50 points. So he had the, had the most, had the biggest fantasy game of his year and it set so many people, right? So. Titans running back Derrick Henry on his team was feeling pretty good. He ran for 238 yards and four touchdowns uh, in beating the Jacksonville Jaguars 30-9 to on that Thursday night. According to NFL Network, that was the biggest fantasy football game of the 2018 season by any player. Um, he had 47 fantasy points standard league. That was the most by any player. That year, anyone close was Mitchell Trubisky with 43, Ryan Fitzpatrick with 42, Drew Brees with 40, Matt Ryan with 40. So he beat out four quarterbacks to have that much. And most people weren't feeling great because they had him on their bench and other people like myself also had him on the bench. And not that many people had him started while well, a few picked him up after Kareem Hunt was cut by the Chiefs. So... It was really, really insane. Now, I don't know how some people, I don't know what type of type of plays that people had to where Derrick Henry was getting 
76 uh, statistics worth in fantasy football. So everybody had him on their bench, really. And there's really no scenario worse. So having Derrick Henry on the bench may be bad, but being out, being in the first round of the playoffs to go up against Derrick Henry and he's scoring against you would be pretty bad. I don't know which one is worse. So it's just, it was just painful. I did not enjoy it whatsoever. And I remember it fondly. So I used that pain, that passion, that aggression. So I used that to, to basically fuel, fuel my name change. Let's go and see Derek Henry's 2018 stats. So Derek Henry 2018. I like typing sounds in, uh, you know, <laughs> I like, I like typing sounds in. So in 2018, Derek Henry had an interesting, you know, his year was, was pretty standard. He still had, he cracked a thousand yards on 215 attempts. So it wasn't horrible, but he only rushed 66 yards per game. Although he had 12 touchdowns, he had four of them in that game. So at that point in the season, in, in week 14, he had eight touchdowns and only averaged 66 yards per carry. It was not great. I got to tell you, not great. Not great. We'll go to the game splits, right? Let's go to the game splits. Boom. So here we are, December 6th versus Jacksonville. 238 yards for TDs, longest yard, yard, longest run was 99 yards per carry. After that, but before that, let's, let's see this before that, right? He had 40 yards on 10 attempts, one touchdown. Before that, eight attempts, 30 yards. Before that, 46 yards, nine attempts. 58 yards, 11 attempts. 6 attempts, 27 yards. 12 attempts, 33 yards. It, it, it was not good. He was not good. Not good. Not, not good. Not good. He was horrible the whole season. The entirety of the whole season, he was horrific. They just weren't giving him the football. But after December 12th, they, he didn't get a touch under 16. So we, in December 6th, he got 17 touches. December 16th, they gave him 33, 170 yards, two touchdowns. In week, in the next week afterwards, he got 21 touches for 84 yards, a touchdown. In the week after that, in a loss in Indianapolis, gave him 16 touches for 93 yards. And ever since then, Derrick Henry has been essentially a big time stud <laughs> in all all sense of the word, right there. So, in reality, this maybe catapulted him to a whole other stratosphere, maybe that set him up for the the greatness that we see today and what Derrick Henry has become in football terms as a a trucker, a truckload, a guy that handled the whole running back load. Someone like a Zeke, maybe even better than Zeke. Uh, I think he went so low in the draft because they expected he had too much tread on his tires. But here we are. Derrick Henry is a, a star-studded guy. But that is why my team name last year was Derrick Henry and the Scammers. Because at the end of the day, I ended up being scammed by Derrick Henry and the Tennessee Titans. And lost a playoff game. And I probably would have lost anyway in the next round. But that is the that is just something I'll never forget that Derrick Henry dropped almost fifty points on us in fantasy and he was on my bench. Alright, so with that said that's the GSMC Fantasy Football Podcast. Thank you all for listening. Don't forget to rate and review us on whatever platform you choose. Please five star, five stars, and keep it rocking with us throughout this whole quarantine and forever on, man. You know, we're just every day is a grind. We keep going. Thank you all for listening and see you all next time. 
You've been listening to the Golden State Media Concepts Fantasy Football Podcast, part of the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. You can find this show and others like it at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Download our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Just type in GSMC to find all the shows from the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network from movies to music, from sports, to entertainment, and even weird news. You can also follow us on Twitter and on Facebook. Thank you, and we hope you have enjoyed today's program.